Well, please open your Bibles at 2 Corinthians in chapter 5. And we come today to the last message in our series, Don't Lose Heart. Uh, it is easy to lose heart, and we've found a number of reasons as to why that is the case, the difficulty of life in this body, which uh, uh, the Scripture describes as being like uh, a tent, uh, the feeling that uh, things that we do in life may not have much lasting significance uh, or value, uh, the harsh judgments, the uh, unkind critique that other people may launch against you the disappointments that come in the plan that you had for your life, the frustrations that you have with what you are in the flesh, uh, the sheer frustration and difficulty and weight and burden of the evil that is in this lost and in this rebellious world. And what has been so striking to me in this series as we've worked our way through 2 Corinthians and chapter 5 is to see again just how directly God speaks to the real issues of our lives. These are the things that cause me to lose heart. These are the things that cause you to lose heart. And if we are to be encouraged in these situations so that we do not lose heart, we need to find ways to come against them. And that is exactly what we've been seeing and learning as we have worked our way through 2 Corinthians and chapter 5. Now, today we come to a last way of losing heart, and the answer to it uh, a way of losing heart that is familiar to every person who really wants to live a godly life. If the Holy Spirit lives in you, if you have really come to love God, if you have a genuine desire that God has planted within you to live a holy life, a godly life, then you will often feel that your own sins may cause you to lose heart. It's important to realize that um, a heightened awareness of sin is actually something that happens in the experience of godly people. And there are three reasons for this. One is the direct work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we are told in Scripture that He comes to convince of sin. Uh, he comes into a person's life like a great light. And, uh, you know, dirt shows up whenever there is a bright light on. If you go into a dark theater, it's not very easy to see um, uh, if the place is clean or not. But when you turn on a bright light, then anything that was hidden in the darkness is obviously brought into, into view. So the work of the Holy Spirit in any human life uh, shines into the dark corners of our hearts and gives to us, therefore, an awareness of sin. It's one of the marks of the active work of the Holy Spirit in a person's life, and the lack of this awareness is one of the marks of the absence of the Holy Spirit from a person's life. And when the Holy Spirit uh, shines light into the dark corners of our life, he, he also shines the light on Jesus, the Lamb of God, that takes away the sin of the world. Because His work is never to condemn us, it's to convict us in order to lead us to Christ and to keep us walking with Christ. And so the Spirit of truth will regularly lead you as a Christian believer back to the great truth of all that Jesus accomplished in the cross. And that is why it's so important that what we're looking at in this one verse, verse 21 today, should be clear and should be settled in the mind and in the heart of every Christian believer. A second reason why a heightened awareness of sin is the experience um, of a person who wants to grow in the knowledge of the Lord is that this is very clearly a strategy of the enemy. Um, Satan is described in the Bible as the accuser of the brothers. That is, he accuses Christian brothers and sisters, which means that he, he, he works against a Christian uh, by bringing to mind your sins, your failures, in a way that may cause you to lose heart. Now, here's something to remember. This is a strategy that Satan only uses with Christian believers. It would be completely against his interest to do it with anyone else. 
His main strategy with sinners is to keep them in the dark about their sin, to keep them never thinking about their sin, to keep them in denial about their sin, to make them think that it's no issue at all, and I can just keep carrying on this way, and it will not make any difference to my life now, nor my eternity in the future. That's what he wants to do with the person who's not in Christ. But when a person is really set on a godly life, he has to switch to the opposite strategy, and this is what he he does. He tries to raise to your memory past sins, and you say, that was a long time ago. Now, why has it come back to my memory now? And it comes back to your mind, and when it does, you need to know how to deal with it and how to set your heart at rest again in the presence of God so that you do not lose heart. And the third reason why this um, heightened awareness of sin is the distinctive experience of a Christian believer is that the Christian believer has a godly impulse in his or her own heart. That's why when John writes to true believers, he says in 1 John 3.20, he speaks about whenever our hearts condemn us. It's very interesting, whenever. He doesn't say if ever, as if it would only be an occasional and unlikely thing. He says to Christians, whenever our hearts condemn us, as if to convey that it will not be an unusual experience for a person who really is seeking to walk with God to find that there's a sense of condemnation that arises from their own heart. Why? Because the Christian has a new heart, and the new heart has a godly impulse. Therefore, the new heart that God has placed within you is sensitive to sin, hates its presence, discerns its subtlety, longs for the day when it will be completely gone. Christian, your own heart, precisely because it is a new heart, will sometimes condemn you, and you need to know how to answer your own heart. Now, here is something that's one of these strange things that's completely the opposite of what you might first think. You might think that the awareness of sin would be something that you would find in people who are far from God, and that it would be much less in the life of a person who's really progressing in holiness. But actually, completely the opposite is true for the three reasons that we have just stated. The awareness of sin is greatest in those who are most vigorously pressing after holiness of life. Why? Because the light of the Holy Spirit shines into their lives, because they have a new heart that's sensitive to sin. They long for greater deliverance, and Satan is always accusing them. Now, the person who's far from God is in a completely different position. That person usually has very little awareness of sin. He thinks of himself, if you talk to him him or she thinks of herself, as a good person, a good person who basically has had to fight against a lot of difficulties in life and and so on. Uh, That person who's far from God will think, I'm not sure there's any point in a whole sermon on the subject of sin. Isn't there something more practical to talk about on a Saturday or on a Sunday? This person isn't concerned about sin. It hasn't bothered him. He hasn't been thinking about it. And Satan never accuses him because he wants him to stay as asleep towards these realities as he is right now. So, I'm saying to you that if a sense of your own sin is not an issue in your life, you may be further from God than you think you are, and you should be concerned about the state of your own soul. And if it is an issue in your life, you should be encouraged, because this is something that is found in those who are making progress, those in whom God is at work. And we're going to see how we are to respond to these things and to set our hearts at rest in His presence from this verse of the Bible today. So, I speak then in this message to every person who wants to live a godly life, and I speak knowing that this is an issue for you. You are sensitive to your own sins. 
you do say to yourself from time to time, here I am a Christian, and how could these thoughts have been in me? You do say to yourself from time to time, why have I not made more progress? Why did I suddenly speak like that with that sharp tongue? Why am I so reluctant to pray when I have been a Christian all these years and I know how important this is? And sometimes you lose heart. Now, when you lose heart in regards to this issue of your own remaining sin as a Christian believer, I want you to take to heart this verse that's before us today, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. Look at these words. For our sake, He, that is God the Father, made Him, that is God the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, for our sake He made Him to be sin, who knew no sin, that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. One writer, Philip Hughes, says, there is no sentence more profound than this in all of the Bible. I understand why he says that. This verse, which you should know, mark, underline, take into your heart and into your whole life, this verse is the epicenter of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. And we saw last time that God has removed every barrier to reconciliation with men and with women from His side. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself. That's what He was doing at the cross. But how did He do it? What happened at the cross to bring about this great reconciliation? Well, the answer to that question is in this verse 21, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, let's walk through this verse that is so important together. I want to point out first why it is that Jesus is uniquely qualified to deal with our sins. For our sake, He the Father made Him the Son to be sin who knew no sin. Christ knew no sin. Now, in the Gospels, this was affirmed by the angels, by the demons, and by God the Father Himself. You remember the words of the angel coming to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Do you remember how Jesus began in ministry, and He comes into a town, and there's a person possessed by an evil spirit, and the evil spirit calls out through the person's vocal cords, what do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to deliver us, destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God, confessed by angels, confessed by devils. Jesus is the only man who has ever lived of whom it could be said he is God. And Jesus is the only man who has ever lived of whom it could be said he is holy. The Lord Jesus Christ was holy in his conception. He was holy in his nature. He was holy in his life. He was holy in his death. He is confessed forever in heaven and even in hell and among His people on earth as forever the Holy Son of God. And therefore, it should not surprise us that we find in Scripture the words of the Father at His baptism and then repeated exactly the same at the time of the transfiguration. A voice from heaven said, 
This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. There is no one else who has ever lived in human history about whom the Father could categorically make that statement. And friends, you know that this is not only the witness of the Gospels, but it is the witness of the entire New Testament, the book of Hebrews reminding us that we have a high priest who in every respect was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Uh, Peter says he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. John the Apostle says of Jesus, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. And here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, we have the Apostle Paul describing our Lord Jesus as the one who knew no sin. Now, why is this important? Here's why. Only a person without sin of their own could be in a position to deal with the sins of others. If it were possible at all for one person to bear the guilt and the sins of others, it would clearly take a person who was holy through and through in himself in order to do that. And here is the unique glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here is yet another reason as to why the Lord Jesus Christ has to be the only way, because who else can stand alongside Him in this? In all of human history, there has never been another person of whom it could be said that He is God, that He is man, and that He is holy. Jesus is uniquely qualified to deal with our sins. Because He is God, He is uniquely able to reconcile us to the Father. Because He is man, He is uniquely able to stand with us as our representative and our substitute. And because He is holy, having no sin of His own, He is therefore uniquely in the position to bear the sins of others and to stand in our place. Why Jesus is uniquely qualified to deal with our sins. Why Jesus Christ can do for you if you will come to Him what no one else in all of the world could do, and what cannot possibly be done in relation to your life or your eternity, except in and through Him. Second, how God deals with people who reconcile to Him in Jesus. Look at this amazing, amazing verse again. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, in him, we might become the righteousness of God. So, what we have in this verse that we're focused on today is a description of what God does for any person who is in Christ, in Him. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself, verse 19. So, here now God stands with open arms, and He's appealing to us, as we saw last week, be reconciled to God. Now, for those who will reconcile to God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, three things are wonderfully true of you, and they're all in this verse, or the one just before. The first is that in Christ, God does not count your sins against you. Now, you see that in verse 19? and it ties directly into what's before us today. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself. How did He do that? Not counting their trespasses against them. Now, the reason that a Christian is reconciled to God, the reason that a person in Christ um, uh, has peace with God, 
is not that he or she is without sin. It is rather that in Christ, God does not count their sins against them. Charles Hodge, who writes on the second book of Corinthians, makes this striking statement about Christians. He said, considered in ourselves, we are just as undeserving and hell-deserving as ever. The act of justification is always one of infinite grace. Now, he's not denying that there's growth and that there's progress in a Christian life. Of course, there is. But what he's saying is this, that if any one of us Christian believers today was taken out of Jesus Christ and just kind of plonked on our own two feet to stand in front of God on the basis of the degree of progress that we've made in trying to live a good Christian life, if we were taken out of Christ, any of us, even the best of us, would be utterly and completely lost, gone, done, condemned forever. Just as if you'd never made any attempt at a Christian life. It would make no difference. It is your standing in Christ that is the saving and the redeeming thing. It's not that you've made progress to a point where you no longer have any sins that God could possibly think of charging against you because you've got such a shiny Christian life. No. It's because He does not count your sins against you. And the more you think about that statement, the more glorious it actually is. So, what happened to these sins that He doesn't count against you? Verse 19. Well, you're in Christ, so guess where they went. That's what verse 21 is saying. Look at it. It's telling us that God counts your sin dealt with in Christ. He doesn't count it against you, but He does count your sin as dealt with in Christ, which is why He says here, verse 21, for our sake He made Him to be sin. This is surely one of the most amazing statements in all of the Bible. Here is Christ, and He's holy in Himself. He's the spotless Lamb of God, and all our sins were laid on Him. My pastor, when I was a teenager, used to always have his notes for a sermon in a little black book exactly like that. I bought one when I became a pastor because I thought I should be like him, though I don't use it now. And I remember many times he would stand in the pulpit and trying to make this as simple as possible, he'd say, here's you, and your sins are on you. Here's what God has done. Here's Jesus, and he's put your sins on him. He who knew no sin became sin for us. That's why our sins are not counted against us. Why? Because they've been laid on Him. Horatius Bonner says this, God dealt with Him as if He were really a sinner such as we are, laid, treated Him as if all iniquity were centered in Him. The Lord laid on Him the iniquity of us all, He, Jesus, was clothed with our guilt. He bore the burden of our iniquities. In all respects, the Father dealt with Him as guilty of our transgressions. Brother, sister, when you think about your sins and you're tempted to lose heart, you remember that your sins were laid by Almighty God on Him, your Almighty Savior and that in Christ this is how God has reconciled you to Himself, not counting these very sins that are weighing you down against you. This is His grace towards you. I love the verse in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9 that says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Have you ever asked the question, why does it say just? That's a strange word to have in there, wouldn't you think? 
Didn't he, you know, why doesn't it say he's faithful and kind to forgive us our sins? Why just? Here's the reason. Because our peace with God, which is a free gift of grace, is actually founded on justice. God has not reconciled you to himself by sweeping your sins under the carpet in such a way that if the carpet was one day pulled up, they could all be stirred up and brought to light again. Now, what he has done is he has reconciled you to himself on a basis of justice by dealing with your sins in Jesus Christ. They were laid on him. They were dealt with at the cross if you are in Jesus Christ. That is true of you. The spotless Lamb of God was made sin for you. He died in your place. He became the sacrifice for us. God made him who knew no sin to be sin, and he did it for us. Friends, if Jesus did not bear our sins, then we bear them ourselves forever. One or the other is true of every person. If our sins are not on him, then they are still on us. But if our sins are on Jesus, they are not on us, and they cannot ever be on us again. They cannot bounce back because they were absorbed and they were dealt with in full by him on the cross. That's why I love the verse of uh, that hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, that says, My sin... Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought that my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. It's gone. It's not on me. It's on Him. And this is what God has done for me in Jesus Christ. This is why He will not and cannot count, his, uh, count sins against those who are in Jesus Christ because they're laid on him. They've been dealt with. Put these two things together. God does not count your sins against you. God counts your sin as dealt with in Jesus Christ. And that takes us to the third thing that's marvelously true of a person in Jesus, that God counts Christ's righteousness as yours. He made him to be sin, who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I try to take this in because it will be at the center of all of our worship in heaven forever and forever. In himself, Jesus was and is the sinless Son of God. But our sins were laid on Him, and God dealt with Him as if He were sin itself. In ourselves, we are sinners, but God's righteousness has been draped on us, and God deals with us as if we were righteousness itself. God dealt with Christ as He deals with sin, even though Christ is holy. And God deals with us as He deals with righteousness, even though we are sinners. Because in Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, and only in and through Jesus Christ, we become the righteousness of God. I love that phrase, the righteousness of God. And Paul speaks about that in Philippians. You might remember, he says, I don't want to have a righteousness of my own that's according to the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Why faith? Because faith is what unites us to Jesus Christ. Faith Faith is what causes us to be in Jesus Christ, and all these things that we've spoken of to be true of you. They become true of you through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You come into Christ by faith. So, the great question then is, are you believing in Jesus? It's not how much progress have you made in the Christian life. 
See, if a person says, and I've sometimes had this kind of conversation with a person, they, they say, well, you know, I, I, I would know that I had peace with God if I prayed more, or if I was more holy, or if I had made more progress. And you see, at that point, they're not seeking to be found in Him, but to be found in their own prayer and in their own holiness and in their own progress. Paul says, that's exactly what I don't want to do. And don't want to be there, because there's never any peace there. What I want is not to be found in my own righteousness, not to be taking my stand before God as if on my own, with my best attempts at living the Christian life. No, I want to be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own, but that which comes through faith in Jesus Christ. So, thank God that when you're in Jesus Christ, He does not deal with you on the basis of what you are in yourself, even what you are in yourself at your best. He sees you in Christ, and in Christ your sins are dealt with and therefore cannot be counted against you. And in Christ, that perfect righteousness of God that is His, was His in His conception, His in His life, His in His uh, death, and His in His resurrection. It's draped on you so that in Him you become the very righteousness of God. Quick application, and then we're through. If you believe this truth, if you believe what we have been learning in this marvelous verse that's the very epicenter of the gospel, if you really believe this, what difference will it make to your life? Let me suggest this to you very simply and very briefly, that if you really believe this with all your heart, you will love Jesus Christ with all your heart. Horatius Boner just puts it so simply, God looks on us in Him, in Jesus, blesses us in Him, loves us in Him, and will glorify and reward us in Him. We're complete in Him. It's our connection with Him through believing that gives us this completeness in the Father's eyes. To the end of our earthly life, we are incomplete in ourselves, and yet from the moment we believed, we became complete in Him. If you believe this, you will quickly come to the conclusion that all your good is in Jesus Christ. When we sing that song that says, hallelujah, all I have is Jesus Christ, you'll say, yes, I'm convinced of that. You will quickly come to the conclusion, if you really believe this, that Jesus Christ is worth more than all the world to you, and there would be nothing that He could ask of you, no sacrifice that He could demand of you that would seem to you to be too great, too much for Him, the Son of God who loved you and gave Himself for you who became sin for you in order that in Him you might become the righteousness of God. You'll love Him. You'll love Him if you believe this. And if you believe this, you will take sin seriously. You believe this you will find yourself saying in your mind and in your heart, look at what sin did to Him. And when you think of what happened on that cross, what it meant for Him to be made sin, and you see how much God hates sin, and you see what it cost Jesus to redeem you from sin, you see that and you believe that, I tell you there will be a new energy in your life to be done with sin. There'll be a new impetus to holy living. You'll no longer be someone who said, oh yeah, I just believe these things. I'm sort of a weekend Christian or whatever. No, no, no. You come to believe this. It's going to energize the pursuit of a holy life that's going to be quite different from the life that you have been living and the life that you would have lived otherwise. Do you, do you have an awareness of sin in your life? 
a sense of how far you are from what God calls you to be, a sense of what it costs Jesus Christ. How, how can the Holy Spirit be in your life if you have no sense of these things? Why are you calling yourself a Christian if you have no concern about these things? Why in the world do you think you're headed for heaven if these things do not matter to you? Oh, but you come to believe what we've been looking at in this verse, and they will matter to you. Because faith in Christ, the Spirit coming into your life, new energy, new momentum to be done with sin and to and to live a new and a different kind of a life. And that's why the last thing to say in this series is simply this, that people who believe this truth will reconcile to God. And that's the whole point of the argument here just in these last verses, isn't it? In Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself. That's what He was doing at the cross, not counting men's sins against them, but laying them on His Son, Jesus Christ, and now He's entrusted to us this message of reconciliation, us who've already been reconciled to Him. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God makes His appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now, I say to you in the last minute of this series, when God has done all of this, why in the world would you walk away from these arms that are stretched out to you this Christ who has gone to this cross for you and offers all these things to you, and this God who wills that they should be yours, be reconciled to God. What kind of folly, what kind of loss is it going to be for you to continue to push this God away? No, be reconciled to God. Why? Because for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him, in him, you might become the righteousness of God. Wouldn't you want that to be true of you today? Let's pray together. In Christ, all this can be yours. In Christ, all this is yours, Christian believer. Troubled heart, discouraged disciple. Bearing shame and scoffing rude in my place, condemned he stood. Sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Lord, I believe. I trust myself to your Son, Jesus Christ, as my Lord and Savior, so that right now my sin may be taken off me, not counted against me, because I am in Him who was made sin for me, that in him I might become the righteousness of God. Oh, Lord, make that true of me. Make me a new creation, a disciple of Jesus, a child of God. And when he shall come with trumpet sound, O oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, so faultless to stand before his throne. Because on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Father, hear our prayers in Jesus' name.